ended. This week um, on Capital Report. I move we adjourn CNA DA. So ordered, CNA DA. The 2024 legislative session comes to a close. It's over. Go home. A win for mandatory paid sick days. It is so important that workers not have to drag themselves to work when they are sick. I have a terrible cold. <laughs> a win for Yukon and state public colleges. It's a jungle out there. You gotta look out for number one, but don't step at number two. While bills on AI and the climate don't make it across the finish line. T, T, come on, I'm burning. What does the governor think about the session? I think the legislature did some important things in this uh, session. I feel good about this. And let's not forget, today is Mother's Day. Hey, Mom! The meatloaf! We want it now! Cap Report starts now. I am Tom Dutcher. We are so glad you're spending part of this Mother's Day. Don't get those mimosas going just yet. Alongside the power panel, the great Danielle Wong, also a mother. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you, Tom. Good morning. <laughs> Joe Ersimowitz, you've been called a mother too, but repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> repeatedly. Liz Kredowitz, also a mother. Happy Mother's Day. This is mimosa. There you go. Johnny Mack, back from the, the Music City, huh? Back from the Music City. Let's, All right, let's go. Let's, let's go, guys. Okay, and just like that, poof, the 2024 legislative session has come to a close and it was a short session. Well, there were budget adjustments passed, big wins there for UConn, the public state colleges. There's mandatory paid sick leave for all Connecticut workers. And there were failures on bills for the climate, AI, and eviction reform bill. And one of the final days, a bill passed that would provide state aid for striking workers. But hold the phone, guys. Looks like this one will face a veto threat from Governor Lamont. Watch this. It was uh, too cute by half. If you want to have public dollars to support striking workers, have a vote, up or down. I want public dollars to go support striking workers. Um, that was not the bill that I think came out of there. And um, so let's just say I'm very skeptical. Let me see what we end up with. Let me take a look at it. It's so damn vague. I don't really know what's in it, but I am not supportive. Johnny Mack was, was, was sitting around Nashville looking at this going, he's, he's brought the knowledge on this one, Johnny. Have at it. Well, I think the governor's right to veto this bill. First of all, the bill itself is very vague. It's not even fleshed out yet. So that alone is like, go back and do it the right way if you want to. But on the right way, why should government be taking money from taxpayers to give to striking workers when the unions collect dues from their members for that purpose? But instead, the unions are using all that money for politics. In 2020 election cycle, the AFL-CIO spent over $5 million on political donations. Public sector unions, over $90 million on political donations. That's money they're getting from their members. They could use that money to protect their members when they go out and strike, rather than give it to politicians, which, by the way, is about 90% to Democrats. And, and if you look at the bill, it, it really was a haymaker. They tried to put something together. The original bill couldn't get over the finish line, and they had $3 million attached to it going over the comptroller's office for him to figure out what benefits are available. The reality is now what we saw in the last few hours of the budget is the money in that account that was supposed to go over isn't there anymore. It's actually in, in deficit. So I think the governor will veto it, rightly so. But the discussion of the issue needs to happen open and honest. Honestly, and I think that was the problem they faced in the Senate and Representative Harding or Senator Harding, I'm sorry, um, really took the fight to him on it and drew it all the way to the last hour. It will be vetoed and it won't go into place. We'll have the debate next year. Yeah, look, I think what was interesting, too, is that Connecticut would become only the third state in the country to, to do this, right? Even in California, Governor Newsom vetoed a similar bill. So if, if Gavin Newsom is vetoing a bill, you really <laughs> got to take notice. I think also the governor is right to listen to Connecticut employers. RTX came out very strongly in opposition to this. They employ over 16,500 people, and, and they contribute over $2 billion in the supply chain for small businesses and, and supply suppliers alone and they said this is one of the most egregious bills and and further evidence of Connecticut being an antagonist to the business community so the governor is right to veto it and if you're going to put it forward at least have a thoughtful discussion 
and, and allow the business community to come to the table. Yeah, I think largely this is not about the workers' right to strike and, and be able to come to the table with strength in, in their negotiations to negotiate fair wages and a right to work, right? But what this is about is about process. It's about whose responsibility is it to pay uh, for workers when they are on, are on strike? Is it the taxpayer uh, for paying into state income or is it going to be the businesses? And that's really where the argument lies. So yeah. more transparency into the process put people on the spot, make sure that they vote up or down with re regards to this, but largely, like, let's support labor and figuring out how to do this together. You'd probably not rather have that money go to Bloomfield, right? Of, of course, <laughs> of course. Okay, so when, the le so when the House leaders walked out of the chamber at the end of the session, what was their overall impressions and how things went? Watch this, here's a wrap-up. You talk about the budget, higher education, um, nonprofits. You know, it's never a perfect year, particularly in the second year of a session. It's only 90 days, but we're pretty happy, and you can tell, I think, as the chamber leads, people are in pretty good mood. I think what we didn't accomplish, I continue to point to, is uh, the crafting of this budget outside the fiscal guardrails. I think um, this budget has been left now for the governor to try to jam back into um, our fiscal guardrails, and so he's going to have some work ahead of him, and I'm hopeful that... Uh, uh, that, that we'll see a budget come out of that office that is something that we would support. Same. Well, Danielle, I think when, when the people look back at this session, they will look at paid sick leave as one of the things that they accomplished that most people agree with, right? Uh, absolutely. I think it's a groundbreaking uh, stride forward, universal paid sick leave by 2027. So very excited and proud of my fellow Dems for really pushing that through yeah. the finish line and really doing some um, progressive strides in that respect. So um, one thing that I wasn't really, um, you know, didn't see it coming was the reduction of Husky eligibility. And so reducing the Husky eligibility requirements so for a family that is making a roughly forty thousand dollars they move down the poverty line so those that are eligible have to make roughly around thirty three thousand dollars so what that does that do for our seniors that need these services our families that need these services it really does impact the most vulnerable so I'm trying to see you know how we're going to supplement that if we do so yeah. really disappointed in that particular reduction of service yeah I think this was probably a, a really antagonistic session for the business community I think we talked obviously about the striking workers paid sick leave is going to create huge burdens for particularly our small business community and they missed opportunities to take on uh, lowering health care costs uh, for Connecticut residents by uh, instituting the association health care plans and things like that so you know from the business community perspective I think a lot of missed opportunities I think you know it's an election year short session um, so you really are not going to get as much uh, you know huge policy change legislations you would see in a longer session. Uh, we saw the EV mandate bill die. We saw the climate change bill uh, die, mostly probably because it was really sort of a House Democrat bill without the Senate Democrats being part of it. Um, I think we'll see all of those issues come back in a longer session with a new legislature. Yeah, and, and I'll just talk to the process of it. I, I want to give kudos to all the leaders up there. There was not the many multiple late nights. There wasn't going into the morning. They were able to get their business done. Senator Harding had to cut deals with Senator Looney to get over the finish line. They seemed to do that. They actually left seven minutes on the clock before <laughs> seeing ADA. Um, and the House, the That's House like did not... 200 bills on consent. 200 <laughs> bills. <laughs> um, and the House didn't go past midnight. They started on time. So those little things to where the public watching sees it in full daylight there's none of those late nights to where it's passed in the dark of the night yeah, and this is maybe insider but as our politics gets more divisive as yeah. we see that on social media the fact is the institution in Connecticut works really well. really I know well. that frustrates some people but it shouldn't it works really well and it worked well this time hey guys and speaking of ARPA money I'm getting likes these acronyms Republicans and Democratic leaders see things differently about where those COVID relief dollars will be spent guys watch this the governor and the Democrats decided to take the easy, irresponsible way out and spend the last bit of federal money uh, and make some adjustments that is going to create a lot of pain for the state of Connecticut a year from now. So you got to defend that record. You voted against community colleges, which would have led to a tuition increase. You do whatever you want. You got to defend it. Uh, you voted against municipal aid for your town. Uh, I mean, good luck. 
And the poor tobacco <laughs> fund, guys, that got swept too. It got zeroed it out. So, uh, so there you go. Q sweet, uh, sweet Caroline sweeps all over. Sweeps right. <laughs> Look, I think for the speaker to say you have to defend, I, I'm looking forward to him defending their ARPA expenditures. I mean, it, the uh, CSCU, for example, asked for roughly about $60 million. They ended up with 100. UConn asked for about $65, $70 million. They're ending up with 100. And all of this is happening while our special education uh, resources across every town in the state is underfunded by $80 million. So go ahead and defend that. I mean, you, when you look at how they've spent these dollars, the ARPA funds are not going to lower tuition. That is so disingenuous. This is one-time funding. This is not going to have an impact on the fiscal health of our CSU and, and our universities in higher ed whatsoever. Tuition hikes are still coming. See, I think it was incredibly smart the way they went about doing it. If you opened up the budget, you were instantly in a $175 million hole. I give credit to uh, the House Republicans for coming up with a budget given those parameters, but it was very difficult. The ARPA money is going to go back to the federal government at some point if we don't spend it. So get it out the door. But you're right, the budget battle, if there is to be, will be next year. Those carry forwards are going to come in as holes next year. We already have a little bit of a deficit built in. Are you going to tackle the guardrails? We spent a lot of time talking about it. But the reality is it has to be done next year at some way or you're going to have a huge budget hole. Yeah, it, it did. And, you know, I want to give uh, credit to uh, two of my former colleagues, Senator Kevin Kelly, Senator Tony Wong, both voted for those budget adjustments because, as they said, one, the ARPA money has to go out the door. Yep. And there may be a di different way to do it, but it's got to be spent. Two, there is more money for social services and nonprofits. And that's really important. So you look at some of the bad, you look at some of the good. Um, I think the good was good now, as long as everybody knows ARPA is a one-time deal. Yeah. Nathaniel, wrap it up. I think I agree with you, John. Um, I agree with Senator Hong, one of the few Republicans who did vote for the stabilization bill. This went to people. This yeah. went to organizations to support that. And we have to figure out what we are as a state. Are we, you know, people, it, there are people behind these numbers. There are humans yeah. behind these numbers and they are falling through the cracks. They are falling through the safety net. And this is, this is, you know, we do have to figure out, I do agree with you, Coach. Yeah. Next year, we do have to figure out how to balance that, how to uh, come and fill in those gaps that we know we've made this week, this this time. Yep. But these are people at the end of the day, and we have to support the social services or everything is going to implode. All right, guys. Well, so now that the 2024 legislative session is in the rearview mirrors, what comes next? When Cap Report comes back, we're going to take a look into the crystal ball and what's ahead for the 2024 election with Newsday's political, political contributor, Mike Cerulli, my pal. We get back. Do not go away, Mike. Stand by. Right. You can work about his job as you weaken. With the 2024 legislative session now officially adjourned, we thought it'd be a good idea to take a look at some of the upcoming elections that will decide the balance of power in Hartford. And who better to do that than News 8's political contributor, our pal Mike Cerulli. So Mike, let's talk about some of the key races. Which ones are you watching? Hey, good morning to you, Tom. Let's uh, start today with some of those key state Senate races outnumbered. Two to one already, the Senate Republicans are in a tough position of having to defend several acutely vulnerable members. Beginning down in southwestern Connecticut at the far tip of Fairfield County there, incumbent Republican Ryan Fazio gearing up to defend his seat against Democrat Nick Simmons. Fazio's last race was decided by less than 100 votes. And if you hop on the merit, head north toward Fairfield in the 28th district. That's John McKinney's old seat. Incumbent Republican Tony Huang facing off against Democrat Rob Blanchard. Like the Greenwich seat, the race in the 28th will be kind of a barometer for the state of Trump-era suburban politics. We'll get a chance to see the dynamics of how that Trump-Biden rematch is playing down ballot. If you move out of Fairfield County up north towards Simsbury in the 8th Senate District, where Republican Lisa Seminara is facing a rematch with Democrat Paul Honig in what is expected to be another very close race. Mike, not just the R's and D's, though, right? We got a few other interesting primaries, huh? Certainly, certainly. In particular, two Democratic incumbents are facing what could be interesting primary challenge. In the uh, second district, Doug McCrory facing off against a pair of challengers, including the secretary treasurer of the Connecticut AFL-CIO. And in Bridgeport, the senator and Reverend Dr. Heron Gaston facing a contest from Ernie Newton. 
Ernie Newton blast from the past, really, huh? And that's not all the action in Bridgeport, right? We've got some changes going on besides Ernie. Right, right. In the 22nd District, which also includes Trumbull and Monroe, we have a potential primary brewing there as well. State Senator Marilyn Moore recently announced she will not seek re-election, and that set off quite the race to replace her. Former Bridgeport Councilman Tyler Mack has been calling around for support. Trumbull Democrats appear to be coalescing around Quinnipiac law professor Sujata Gadkar Wilcox and former Bridgeport mayor Bill Finch looking to throw his hat in the ring as well. So we'll be watching that contest closely and we want to especially wish Senator Moore, a big Capitol Report fan and my state senator, all the best in her future endeavors. Mike Cerulli raised in the 22nd. If elected, would not serve Cerulli, right? In full <laughs> campaign no, mode. No, we'll be here. No. Yeah, you got a TV career, Mike. Left, left back from you down the road on all these races, Mike. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Up next on Cal Report, a look at some of the hits and some of the misses from the 2024 legislative session. We get back. Do not go away. If elected, will not serve. What is that? Look, we're 300 to $400 million apart from the governor on spending. That's, that's where we are. It's not insurmountable. Wayback machine, a pretty spot on prediction there from our pal House uh, Speaker Matt Ritter, which brings us to the segment we call Cheers and Jeers from the 2024 legislative session. And Joe Simmons, I teed up the first one for you, Joe Simmons. Uh, it, look, it, it's somewhat easy, but a little bit embarrassing. Uh, the cheer has to go out to the speaker for a lot of reasons. Uh, the prediction, having a right prediction, which is a speaker first. You all know my famous incorrect predictions. <laughs> um, he, he was exactly right, and he got to ride that UConn wave, right? UConn winning the national championship, UConn women over exceeding expectations. And a jeer. And the jeer has to be the eviction uh, regulation that was floating around the legislature now four years. Nothing's been done. It's failed yet again. We have to have an honest discussion about that moving forward. You can't do what they're trying to do. Let's find a balance. See right, if Liz, get it done. Time, time for you to step up the plate. Coach, Coach jeers. Shock to everybody. Vin Candelora, uh, House, my cheer. Vin to, Candelora, to Vin, that's your Vin problem. Candelora, the House Republicans and, and the Senate Republicans as well. As you said, Coach, you know, Vinny and the House Republicans were the only ones in the building that really took their obligation seriously to address the budget <laughs> shortfalls they know are coming in the out years. They put a budget together that actually resonated with their principles of funding uh, K-12 education. And, and they, both caucuses shut down yet again one of the governor's hallmark marquee uh, priorities in the uh, electric vehicle mandate that would have crushed uh, working families. So cheers to them. The jeer has to be the lack of real election reform. Mm -hmm. the, the lipstick on a pig bill that they passed does absolutely nothing to prevent uh, more fraud and to actually take seriously our election integrity issues. Uh, this was one of the most egregious things in a stain on Bridgeport in the state of Connecticut and, and they did absolutely nothing to stop it. Hey Mary, your turn. Cheers and cheers. Well, the cheer is something we don't really talk about too much. Shout out to Senator Cohen for securing $5 million to pay down kind of on the reservation um, initiatives for the East Line Shore, uh, the East the Shoreline East uh, Line. So I know that there are some struggles with getting people to ride the line, and we have to figure out how to, you know, get that district in uh, in play and make sure that people take advantage of the, some of the transportation opportunities at that place. But shout out to that and the, the collaboration with the DOT. The Bagel know. Queen of Connecticut. The yes. Bagel, okay, <coughs> right. And then I think my jeer is going to have to be climate change. We are far losing ground. We're, we're missing the mark on this one. And I keep saying it. We're really focusing on the energy piece. We're leaving behind the environment piece. And we have to figure out how we're going to get municipalities involved. Uh, what we're going to see throughout the cities and towns is a lot of these battery storage places being erected in these cities and towns. And they are going into our wetlands. They're going into our open space. And if we don't pay attention locally on the ground, we're going to lose our environment um, inch by inch. Uh, kind of the best for last. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Listen, wow. My, my cheer as a Westport resident goes out to the Department of Transportation, the Governor's Administration, Governor Lamont, Commissioner Eucalito, who does a fantastic job, and all of their workers for getting that bridge in Norwalk. That That's Westport amazing. was a parking lot, uh, and they got that done faster Johnny than Matt, couldn't get to the could package imagine. store. Couldn't get to the package <laughs> store. Was your and, problem. By the way, it's the second time they've done that because they replaced the bridge in Westport in a weekend. So they've done a tremendous job. We always made fun of DOT when I was a youngster. No longer. Congratulations to all their workers and Commissioner Eucalito. 
My dear, my dear goes to the lack of our pension investment reform. Uh, Treasurer Russell has made some good progress and some reforms, uh, but the legislature was presented with a nonpartisan, incredible analysis by our friend uh, Jeffrey Sonnefeld, Dean at the Yale School of Management. Steve Tyen. Steve Tyen. Steve Tyen. Um, there were some great recommendations there. They didn't have to accept all of them, but they didn't do any of them. That's an issue that I hope we're going to continue to beat the drum on, and I hope uh, uh, Sonnefeld and Ty and our friends uh, don't go away. They continue to fight for those reforms. All right, guys, next up on Capitol Report, preserving a Thanksgiving tradition in Connecticut. <laughs> it says Erasimowitz written all over it. Well, <laughs> details we get back don't go away. How about the lollipop? They made the lollipop. Yeah. They can't what about the Well, Joe Arasimowitz and the Berlin Red Coast football team can breathe a sigh of relief. High school football on Thanksgiving in Connecticut, well, being protected under a state law. Get this, the bill prevents school boards from adopting any policies that prohibit games from being played on Turkey Day. There's been debate over whether Thanksgiving games interfere with family gatherings. And now, if a school wants to schedule a Thanksgiving game, there's nothing a school board can do to stop it, Joe Harrison was. I said your fingerprints are on this one, I, on the bond bill. I had nothing to do with it, but I will say it, it, it keeps me out of the house and away from my family for Thanksgiving because I have to scout. So I like that it's in there, but I had nothing to do with it. I think it's great. <laughs> I, I, some of my best high school memories are going to a football games on Thanksgiving, even when we were getting our butts kicked by Bloomfield. So <laughs> yeah, they're it's early still enough, a good too. Yeah, early enough, yeah. 10, 30, 11 o'clock. It's definitely a to go time. do the turkey it, trots or whatever, yeah. too. <laughs> you got to do it in a towns like Fairfield where you have two high schools. Yeah. That's the rivalry yeah. game. The whole town gets yeah. out. It's 100%. at 10 or 11 o'clock yeah. in the morning. It has to happen. They can never do away with Make that. Make it a part of family tradition. And, and you look at West Hartford where you have Connard and Hall. The, the, the records go out the window, and it really is about bringing the town together. I understand why I wanted to keep it. Didn't need legislation. Uh, okay, so we'll do it for Mother's Day edition of the Capitol Happy Report for the mayor, the coach, Happy Mother's Day, Day. Mother's Day. Mother's Day. 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 Day